Good morning, everyone. Happy to see you. So glad that you're here. It's a great summer day, and it's not too hot yet, but just wait. It'll be a little bit later on. Carl, happy to see you. So it's a great day to be here. Thank you so much for, cho uh, for choosing to join us here at First Baptist Church. Well, it's a wonderful day to worship. And uh, if you're um, a guest with us or if you're a regular attendant, you see there's a, a connection card there in the pew rack in front of you, or if you'd like to scan the code here on the back of the worship guide, uh, you can get to where you could uh, give us information about your visit or have prayer requests. There's also links for where you could uh, give uh, to support the, uh, the mission of the church as well. All those are, are regular things which you would see on a regular basis. We encourage you to use that as you have need. I want to point out that um, we're not able to stream our service today. We've got some issues with our link on that, but we, uh, for those that tend to watch that later on. We will have that uploaded, and we're going to try to have that fixed before next Sunday. Sorry that's not working today. Uh, this week is children's camp. We've been looking forward to this for quite some time, and I know that the, those who lead our children have been preparing uh, as always, and we look forward to that day. It starts tomorrow at 9 a.m. and goes through Thursday, I believe, right? And hopefully everyone has pre-registered for that as was called for have questions, uh, please, uh, you see Charla or any of the children's workers, which are typically right around here at the end of the service. We'd be happy to try to answer questions for you at that time. It's also, I um, want to point out that as a result of that going on this week, there are a couple of room changes. Now, I know, brace yourself, room changes, right? But it's all so that the kids uh, have an opportunity to have the, the camp during this week. So on Wednesday morning, the prayer meeting time will be uh, in room 103, which is the all the way down um, past the office and around to the right. Uh, that'll be Wednesday morning for prayer meeting time. And then uh, Thursday morning's quilting time will be in the library. And remember, it's all being done for the kids' camp during that time. Uh, you also want to note that, uh, let's see, you know, we have Vacation Bible School at, at Calvary Baptist. One of our sister churches in the association is having Vacation Bible School the following week. And there's an opportunity for children associated with our church or actually throughout the community to be involved with that. And we would encourage you to make that known to them by going to calvaryrosenberg.org is their church website. And there's an opportunity to register for that. And we always want to encourage children to take part in Vacation Bible School whenever possible. And finally, I want to let you know that um, Claire Rogers uh, will be bringing in a brief report on behalf of the steering committee at the end of the service today. So at the end of that, that time, please uh, look forward to that. The steering committee is very active and you want to hear about what's been going on recently and what's coming up in the future. Okay, I can, once again, we're so pleased that you're here. Let's stand, please, and join together in singing all creatures of our God and King. Oh, silver. 
Tim uh, uses a tomb which is, I'm sure will be familiar to, or most of us, it uses the, the tomb which is often sung to the text, Jesus shall reign where'er the sun. This is a different text for us, from all that dwells below the skies. You can be seated. We'll have a scripture reading now. It's taken from several, several passages uh, in the Bible, from Romans chapter 10, from Luke chapter 24, and from Matthew 28. We'll read, I'll ask you to read the gold text, and then I'll read that which is in white. So it starts with us all reading together. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sin will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I commanded you. And surely I am with you always at the very end of the age. That great promise at the end there that God promises to be with us. We now sing a series of songs that remind us that whatever our cares may be, God never leaves us. Let's sing those promises now. tell you what I think of Jesus, since I found in him a friend so strong and true. I would love to praise him not completely. He did something that no other friend could do. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no Oh, 
Savior leads me, what have I? 
Let's have prayer now as we prepare to accept our offering today. Lord, we thank you for the day. Thank you that you are the one who will take our burdens and carry them away. We lay them at you and trust you for that. And now, Lord, as we take this time to give tithes and offerings, we do so with thankful hearts and trust that you will bless it and honor it for the, your kingdom work. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Wow, it's tough to follow all of that. Thank you, Brian and Celebration Choir and Jan, for all of you who have led us in worship and you've been doing that for uh, a long time now. And just for the last few Sundays and uh, for a couple more at least, I'll get to be part of that and I'm excited about it. I'd kind of like to stick around as long as I can, you know. Uh, I have a few <laughs> other things I need to do, but. But uh, trust me, this is, these are cherished moments with you. And God bless you, dear brothers and sisters, the saints of God, the First Baptist Church of Rosenberg, Texas. I want to introduce to you uh, some other special people for me. And they are with me and with my wife, Beth, today. And uh, I need to tell you, we have... A total of eight grandchildren and we you can divide them into two crops of four all right and so we have four older ones 
and they're, they're either teenagers or on the verge of being teenagers. And then we have four preschoolers and babies coming right after them. So there's, you know, just as soon as we finish with one crop, we've got another one coming along. Uh, and we didn't, we didn't plan it that way. We didn't intend it. That was, that's just the way God has given to us with three grown children now. And they're always glad to give us time with their kids. And who knows what they're doing uh, in, in, in the meantime. But this is what we call, and this is our fourth year of calling it Island Camp Week. Uh, some of you know that Beth and I have a home uh, moving toward retirement in Galveston. And uh, so we are typically there uh, two or three days at the end of the week before you see us uh, on Sunday or somebody sees us on Sunday. And then we, uh, uh, every June, we'll have what we call as Island Camp Week. And we have our grandchildren who are old enough for it to come and they wear us out for several days. Tomorrow, if, if weather permits and the tide uh, is right at the right time and all, We'll, we will have strings with chicken necks and chicken wings in the water catching crabs, and uh, we'll be swimming and do it miniature golf and everything you can imagine during the good old summertime uh, at the beach. So I want to introduce you to these four, and I'm going to ask each one of you to stand and sing a song. No, I'm you know, I have to do that. Uh, what I meant was quote a scripture verse. No, you don't have to do that. But uh, as, as I mention your name, just stand and remain uh, standing. There's uh, Cade, stand up Cade, all right. And then Caleb, stand. These are our two, remain standing. I didn't tell you you could sit down, all right. These are two 14-year-olds, right, separated by a few months. Their, their moms are sisters, all right. And then Caleb has a sister named Hannah. Hannah is coming along. And then Asher. All right, and the last three are brothers and sisters, and then the first one is their cousin. So they're going to, they're half of the crew, all right? And get used to seeing young faces like that, uh, even this week in your week of day camp and in, in the future that God has for you. Thank you. You can be seated, all right? And uh, you'll be rewarded for that later, all right? Okay. okay. Oh, so good to be with you, and, and I want to ask you uh, as we get started to, to turn uh, with me in your Bibles, or you can follow along in the screen in just a moment, uh, Exodus chapter 5 is where we are, Exodus chapter 5, and we'll be starting in verse 1 in just a moment. The state of Missouri has had many nicknames through the years, but the one that's most widely known is the Show Me State. You know it. And no one knows exactly when or where the expression originated, but there are some guesses. Much of the credit for popularizing the term goes to a congressman, Willard Duncan Vandiver of Cape Girardeau County. Van Vandiver, a scholar and writer and lecturer who served as U.S. representative from 1897, one year after this church began, all right, put it in context, 1897 to 1905. He used the expression during the 1899 speech in Philadelphia. Van Diver bore a strong facial resemblance, resemblance, easy for me to say, to another famous Missourian, Mark Twain. He looked like Mark Twain, and he was noted as a colorful orator. Speaking to Philadelphia's five o'clock club, he questioned the accuracy of an earlier speaker's remarks saying, I come from a state that raises corn and cotton and cockleburs and Democrats. And frothy eloquence neither convinces nor satisfies me. I am from Missouri. You have got to show me. So the expression soon caught the public fancy, portraying Missourians as tough-minded demanders of proof. Some have suggested another origin uh, for the phrase. About 1897 again, one version goes, hundreds of free railroad passes were issued to people connected with the Missouri legislature. The conductor of the railroad, of the train, when told that passengers on the train had passes, would insist, you've got to show me your passes. You've got to show me. So that idea of uh, let's see the proof, you've got to show me, has been there. And God knew 
that Moses and the Israelites and many people of faith afterwards want to see something. God knew that He would have to show them who He was and what He could do for them. And at the right time, they would see it. At the right moment, they would learn. And so there's a pivotal verse we're going to get to, and uh, you don't have to turn there now because we're going to start in chapter 5, but when we get to chapter 6, yes, that's right, we're doing two, two chapters today. You didn't need lunch, did you? All right. We'll, we'll speed through it. But chapter 6, verse 1 is the key verse. All right. And chapter 6, verse 1 is, are these words, Now you shall see. Show me. Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For under compulsion he will let them go. And under compulsion, he will drive them out of his land. You see, we learn about God in several ways, and there are stages, there are steps that we need to understand as sort of a pattern in which God works. He was working that way back in Exodus with Moses and the Exodus. And can I tell you, He still works that way today. And we need to recognize the way that He works because it, it, it means something to us today. And so that's where our story begins. Do you remember? Moses was talking to a bush. All right? And it moves right along, you know. God has given him instructions what to do and what to tell the people and what to say to Pharaoh. And we pick up the story, chapter 5, verse 1. And if you are able to, I invite you to stand for the reading of God's Word. Chapter 5, verse 1. And we'll read just the first three verses for now. And afterward Moses and Aaron came and said to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may celebrate a feast to me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey His voice to let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and besides, I will not let Israel go. Then they said, The God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go a three days journey into the wilderness, that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. Otherwise, He will fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. Thank you. You may be seated. So this is what we're going to learn about about today is that God has a pattern to show who He is. And our takeaway truth today is that God does reveal Himself by His actions, but they are precisely timed to accomplish His purpose and to increase our faith in Him. You see, here's the pattern, and we ought to, we ought to understand it and recognize it. His pattern has been to show the greatest mercy to His people following, you ready? Following a time of great affliction. Or to put it another way, daybreak comes after the darkest night. Now I want you to just capture that thought in your mind and however that might relate to your life personally or to your church corporately. Daybreak comes after the darkest night. After great despair, God says, Now you will see. Now you will see. And so that actually comes out of Exodus chapter 6, verse 1. But before we get to chapter 6, verse 1, there are some things that sort of set the table for this. You see, God knows timing. It's we read, the, we read the phrase, especially in the New Testament, in the fullness of time. Time is very important to God. Although He doesn't live in it, He has put us to live in it. And He acts within it. And so this pattern starts with this. God acts after He has identified Himself. 
in these few verses that we read where Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and says, the Lord says to do this to let his people go. Well, Pharaoh says, well, the Lord, who's he? I never heard of him. You see, in those days, the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, knew that lots of his enemies had their own gods. There, were, there was a pantheon of gods. They were, they were, they were deists but plural in their, in their understanding of gods. And this Pharaoh knew of lots of different gods. In fact, they were territorial gods. And if you went from one territory into another, you moved from the, from the power uh, or, the, or the sovereignty or the jurisdiction of one god to another. And so there were lots of different gods in their understanding. But this one right here, you never heard of him. Who is this God you call the Lord? I don't know about him. I never heard of him. I don't know who he is. And what makes you think that you can just march right in here and say that he says for me to do this? I don't even know if he exists. This God you call the Lord. Here's the funny thing, though. The Israelites didn't really know who he was either. Now Moses and Aaron knew. Moses knew that there was a bush talking to him. And it was burning, but it wasn't burning up. Moses understood that he had confronted a God who said, I am the great I am. And Moses, this is what I want you to do. Moses understood, but the Israelites didn't. And so this, this series of events was about God identifying Himself, not especially just to Pharaoh, but to the ones that He would call His people. And it's that identifying, it's that getting to know, it's getting to, to be acquainted, it's that familiarity, it's that intimacy that God was trying to establish. Because, listen, it's that intimate God, the Lord, that you and I know today. The one who was speaking out of the burning bush to Moses is the one that speaks right into your burning heart today as you seek His guidance and His love and His care for you. He is the same one. But the Israelites were just getting started with Him at this point. They didn't really know who He was. And so if we were to, if we were to read skipping over, hold your finger in chapter 5, but then if you go over to chapter 6, look at verses 2 to 5, just follow along. God, this is a little later, God spoke further to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. Now, key on that. I am the Lord. And I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty, but by my name, Lord, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they sojourned. Furthermore, I have heard the groaning of the sons of Israel because the Egyptians are holding them in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. This is the Lord. He is identifying himself. He's saying to Aaron and Moses, I'm ready. I'm ready to take off the disguise, take off the mask. I'm ready to tell everybody who I am. And he starts out by saying, you know, I appeared to your ancestors. I appeared to, uh, uh, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But when I appeared to them, I didn't identify myself as the Lord. I appeared as God Almighty. Now, some of us might be familiar with the Hebrew of that term, that name God Almighty, is El Shaddai, which is this powerful, protecting God who can just do whatever He wants. And it literally means the God who thunders. The God who thunders. It's this powerful creator, El Shaddai. You see, the term El just meant God. And as a matter of fact, Pharaoh and everybody else knew that that term El meant God. It was a term that was used for lots of different gods of lots of different 
of, uh, of different uh, tribes, people groups, God, El, and so, but when it was used in particular with the Hebrews, with the Israelites, El was the God that they understood to be the creator of the universe. And he barks and bites. He thunders from heaven. He's the God to be feared. But they didn't understand that he was a God of a relationship and a personal loving God. He had appeared to be that powerful, thundering God to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But he says right here, I never named myself as the Lord. Now, now to Moses, Aaron, and the Israelites, he would be Yahweh, Yahweh. You know, just even saying Yahweh was something to be afraid of back in those days. They were afraid to even say or write down Yahweh that they would even write down the four, the four uh, different, uh, uh, I want to say, consonants. Y-H-W-H for Yahweh. Not putting in the vowels. Y-H, some, some call this the tetragrammaton. All right, the tetragrammaton. Y-H-W-H, or some would translate Yahweh would be Jehovah God. You see, in particular, he's saying, yes, I'm the God who thunders. I'm the God who created the universe. I'm the God who, who can do anything I want, but I'm also the personal God who enters into a covenant with my people. I will be your God. You will be my people. I will be more than just a powerful creator of the universe. I will be your personal God and I want to have a relationship with you. And everything that would follow from that would be about the relationship. And my brothers and sisters, it's still about that. It's not just that He is the sovereign, uh, omnipotent God. Yes, He is, but He's also the omnipresent and personal God to you and me. He is El Shaddai. He is the God Almighty, but at the same time, He's Jehovah, my God and your God. And so they would write it down this way in the Old Testament. Instead of writing down Jehovah or Yahweh, they would write just these two words, the Lord the Lord. And whenever you see anything in the Old Testament especially in which he is named as the Lord, and often all caps, L-O-R-D, we understand that is that personal, intimate Jehovah God who offers himself to you and me and has, a, has, has saved a place for you and me in Christ in eternity. It's that one. And so David would say, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And as you read the Old Testament and you see these two words, the Lord, that's more than just the God of the universe. That's more than just God Almighty. He is that personal God that you and I can know. And He offers Himself that way. And so He says, I am the Lord. I am the great I. I am the Lord, as he would speak from the bush. Jesus, the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, the pre incarnate Christ, who was in fact speaking himself from the bush in New Testament times in the Gospels, as he had come to earth, God in the flesh, one of us would look at his disciples, and it's recorded for you and me. I am several times, no less than seven times. This same God, Jehovah, who came in the flesh as the Son of God, says, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door of the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. 
I am the way, the truth, and the life, and I am the true vine. No less than seven times, this same God who said, I am the Lord, to Moses and Aaron and the Israelites, says to you and me, you're one of my sheep, I'm the door to the sheep. I'm the good shepherd of the sheep. You're hungering and thirsting for righteousness. I am the bread of life. You know, you're looking for light in a dark world. I am your light. I'm the light of the world. You want eternal life and in heaven. I am the resurrection and the life. You see, that's how he comes to us. Everywhere we are itching, he scratches it. He's the God who is personal with you and me. And so after he's identified himself, now he begins to tell us what he's going to do. He acts after he has stated what he will do. And in verses 6 to 8, we pick it up again in chapter 6. He says, Say therefore to the sons of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from their bondage. I will also redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. Then I will take you for my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you to the land which I swore to you to give to, to uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I will give it to you. For a possession. I am the Lord. You see how he links together his identity. I am the Lord. I am your Jehovah God. And the one who remembers it, I establish a covenant with you. And I remember it. You understand what we do with the Lord's Supper, with communion? That covenant that Jesus says, this is the new covenant in my blood. We come to remember it with Him. A covenant is no good if you're not remembering it, if you're not continually renewing it and coming back to it. You see, that's what we do when we have the Lord's Supper. And this is a God who never forgets. This is a God who's always remembering His covenant, always remembering the pledge that He made to His people. And good folks of First Baptist Church in Rosenberg, can I just remind you this is the same God who has been with you and your church for over a hundred years now, and he has not forgotten it. He remembers. And he's calling on you to remember it today. Look at all the things that he said he's going to do here for his people. I will rescue you. I will redeem you. I will be your God. I will bring you to the land. Catch that last part there? I will, I will bring you to the land. Well, where is that? We don't know. Stick around and find out. He says to Moses, this is what I'm going to do. You see, what God is doing, this is who I am, and this is what I'm going to do. Those two things. When he says, this is what I'm going to do, by his word, we hold on to that. But now comes the experience part of it. And the experience is very real. I kid you not. The experience. Sometimes it gets dark before the light comes on. It's always been the way it has. It's always been that way. God acts after the faith of His people has been tested. Now Pharaoh had said, I'm not going to let them go. As a matter of fact, I'm going to turn up the heat. And so he turned to, he turned to the taskmasters, who would turn to the foremen of the Israelites, and he said, here's what we're going to do. They're making bricks but from now on, we're not going to give them straw. They're going to have to find their own straw. And we're not going to decrease the number of bricks that they need to make. They've got to come up with the same number of bricks, and they've got to go find their own straw, and this will teach you to come back and ask if they, if they can leave. As a matter of fact, I think they're just lazy. 
So all of the outside voices that don't know God are working against God's people. Sound familiar? Okay. Pharaoh says, I'm not going to let them go. In fact, I'm going to make it more difficult for them. So it, we come down to verse 19. And in verse 19, we're going to read this. But let me just, the foremen of the sons, the foremen were Israelites who were sort of the group leaders. And they're getting their marching orders from the taskmasters, the supervisors of the Egyptians. And the Pharaoh's telling them what to do. And it filters down to the foremen, the group leaders, and the foremen of the sons of Israel saw that they were in trouble. Now the word trouble is not the kind of trouble you and I think about. All right, you, your, your car gets stalled or you get a flat tire, you think, well, this is kind of a bad day. You know, this is, I have trouble. You're in the sink, you drop a glass on the floor, it shatters on the floor, you think that's trouble. No, that's not trouble. That's not trouble. Let me tell you what trouble was to them. You see, the Israelites had felt all along that they were actually in favor of, they were favored people with the Egyptians. They didn't even have any problem being slaves. I mean, they're just working. In fact, they came, they came there centuries before with Joseph, remember? And all along, the Israelites felt like they are, they're pretty much in the catbird seat. You know, they're, they're in a pretty good place with the Egyptians. It's the Egyptians' country, but they, have, they don't have a bad life. They're slaves who didn't really understand that slavery was a bad thing. They didn't want to get up and go anywhere. But God had something better for them. They were going to have to find out. So God is going to use, in fact, in, in chapter 6, verse 1, He said, now you shall see what I'm going to do to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh is going to want them out of there. Okay? But... Before that happened, the time of trouble, watch this now. They went from a, time, a point in which they felt like they were favored to now they're despised and deemed to be lazy. And so they looked at Moses and said, we didn't ask for this. Who are you to get us in trouble with the Egyptians? What are you doing to us? We pick up the story, chapter 5, verse 19. Follow, the, follow with me if you can. 519. The foremen of the sons of Israel saw they were in trouble because they were told, you must not reduce your daily amount of bricks. When they left Pharaoh's presence, they met Moses and Aaron as they were waiting for them. And they said to them, may the Lord look upon you and judge you, for you have made us odious in Pharaoh's sight and in the sight of his servants to put a sword in their hand to kill us. Then Moses returned to the Lord, and watch what Moses says. Moses goes back to the Lord and says, O oh Lord, why have you brought harm to this, this people? Why did you ever send me? Ever since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done harm to this people, and you have not delivered your people at all. Those were his last words before God said to him, now you will see. Okay. Moses, can you imagine talking that way to God? It kind of, for one thing, shows us we can be honest with God. Just at that time in which Moses was saying, why did you send me into all of this? And, and you started all of this, and we can't, basically, we can't trust you. And God said, now you will see. Things getting worse? Things getting dark? Things getting desperate? Good. Now you will see. You see, that's the way that God works in our experience with Him. Is that is that just before the time in which things are going to break for us, we feel like we're broken. Now you will see. And so God acts after He's identified Himself, after He's stated what He's going to do, and then after the faith, 
our faith has been stretched to the limit. Now we will see. A Puritan named Jeremiah Burroughs in the year 1645, almost 400 years ago, wrote a series of sermons. And this is what he titled his little book. You can find it on the internet. The Rare Jewel of Christian Contentment. And I want to read you as we close this a little paragraph of what he writes about this. And I want, as I read this, I want you to think about your life and about your church. He wrote, Usually, when God intends the greatest mercy to any of His people, He brings them into the lowest condition. God seems to go quite across and work in a contrary way. When He intends the greatest mercies to His people, He first usually brings them into very low conditions. If it is a bodily mercy, an outward mercy that He intends to bestow, He first brings them physically low and outwardly low. If it is a mercy in their, in their possessions that He intends to bestow, He brings them low in that, then raises them. And in their reputations, He brings them low there and then raises them. And in their spirits, God ordinarily brings their spirits low, then raises their spirits. Usually, the people of God, before the greatest comforts, have the greatest afflictions and sorrows. I want to read that sentence again. Usually, the people of God, before the greatest comforts, have the greatest afflictions and sorrows. Now, those who do not understand God's ways think that when God brings His people into sad conditions, He is leaving and forsaking them, and that God does not intend any great good to them. But a child of God who is instructed in this way of God is not troubled. My condition is very low, he says, but this is God's way when He intends the greatest mercy, to bring men under the greatest afflictions. When He intended to raise Joseph, to be the second in the kingdom, God cast him into a dungeon for a little while. So, when God intended to raise David and set him on a throne, he made him to be hunted as a partridge in the mountains. God dealt this way with his own son. Christ himself went into glory by suffering. And if God so deals with his own son, much more with his own people, a little a little bef before daybreak, you will observe that it is darker than it was any time before. So God will make our conditions a little darker just before the mercy comes. Saints of God, brothers and sisters of First Baptist Church of Rosenberg, as God would say, I've heard your groanings. He's noticed. He's noticed. But get ready. Because as we turn from Moses' words to God, he was the chief of complainers. All right. The next thing God says, now, now, you will see. It'll be fun to find out. I join you. Thank you, Lord, for becoming a very real and personal God to us. And for what you called us to be as your people, to follow you, to trust you, to obey you, and to watch what you do. And that is what we intend to do. And I pray for this church especially, as they are at that moment between chapter 5 and chapter 6, and they stand willing to see you in action. We trust you more than just as God Almighty, but as the Lord, our Jehovah God. For it's in the name of our Savior we pray. 
Amen. I want to invite you to stand with us as we sing a time of response. If I can pray with you or help you in any way, I'll be down front as we sing together. Out of my bondage, sorrow, and night, Jesus, I come, Jesus, I come, into thy freedom, gladness, and light. Jesus, I come to Out of my sickness into thy help, out of my want and into thy wealth, out of my sin and into thyself, Jesus, I come to thee. Out of my shameful failure and loss, Jesus, I seated for just a moment. Good morning. All right. In the messenger this week, I'm sure you saw the update from the steering committee, so I just want to go over some of that real quickly. Um, we met with Aaron Groff, the representative from Attack Poverty, the group that's going to be purchasing our building. The purchase is on schedule. We anticipate the closing date in mid-July, okay? So there's a lot of things that have to happen between now and then. <laughs> and I'm sure you've seen some cleanup in progress. Some of you are Sunday school leaders or children's directors and in various rooms where you've been asked to go through this stuff. So based on that, Betty has designated a room in the hall right behind me, room 115. That is our garage sale, shopping. Um, if you find anything in that room that you could use, please take it home. <laughs> Don't put it in another room to store it, take it home, okay? And a lot of things in that room have come and gone and come and gone, and we're gonna continue to put things in that room that you can feel free to come and take home with you and use in ways that you need to. Also, the library. We have a lot of books, a lot of really good books. If there's a book in there, a few books in there, a series in there, something that you would like to take home and read and use or give to someone for their ministry, feel free, okay? If you have a question about any of the books in the library, Linda Grimes is your woman. <laughs> She's a librarian and she's been super helpful in helping us sort out and go through things. Now, I will say that one of the pastors of the association is reaching out to a ministry that maybe could use a big section of the um, commentaries and things like that in a ministry that they're starting. So we're waiting to hear from them about those books. But if even you find something in there that you could use in your ministry, please feel free to take that. Okay. That said, um, I've been working in the prop room. I'm meeting with someone who works in um, a drama department at a university, and she's coming this week to go through and see what they can use in their ministry. So we want to bless people with the stuff that we have, okay? But we're sorting out, you know, what goes where and how things go. Now, when we met with Aaron, they uh, attack poverty is being really generous in allowing us to use some spaces in this church in the months going forward. Not forever, but in the months going forward. And we are working with them on exactly which spaces and which rooms. And when all of that is finalized, we'll have a little map 
that shows you who's going to be where, okay? Most of the Sunday school classes will be relocated into the spaces. Um, I'll tell you that Attack Poverty will first of all, after the closing date, their first priority is to move their offices into this building. So Marion and Brian have already located where they want the offices to be and will be doing that move. Um, they are mostly going to be using the second floor of the buildings to start with. So we will be utilizing rooms on the first floor. So that's a change for some of the Sunday school classes and we'll be trying to make those moves by July 1st. I know that there's a couple that may not make it by July 1st. That's okay, we'll get there, okay? All right, um, the committee's also been meeting with Sam and pastors of the association and they are guiding us in the next steps, next steps of the replant process. So I ask you, please continue to pray for our church, for our congregation, and the great work that God is doing and will be doing in us and through us. Thank you. Let me... Uh, just on behalf of the church, say thank you to those that are serving on the steering committee. They're doing a wonderful work and a lot of work, so we thank you for that. And we continue to look forward with great anticipation of how God will lead us in the future. Let's stand, please. And this is your chance to be in the choir to sing our parting song, Glory, Glory, Hallelujah. Glory, glory, Hallelujah. 